Last week, we had a gentleman caller. No, I guess I shouldn't put it that way, should I? We had a gentleman who called into the show, and he asked about how the libertarians were doing and were they electing people, so forth and so on. And when it was obvious that libertarians were not making a big dent politically, he said, I guess you're just the bitch and moan party then. And, of course, to a certain extent, that's true. And I said at the time that we probably were getting to the point of concentrating too much on the negative in the show. I believe very strongly that we have to show people the benefits of liberty. We have to make them want to taste it. We have to make them want it more than anything else in the world. And we're not going to get that by scaring them to death or telling them of all the terrible things that are going on. It's very important to point out what is wrong with American foreign policy. What is wrong with having the government so deeply into health care as it is today? What is wrong with having the government educating our children? But we also must spend a good deal of time dwelling on what it could be like in a better world, in a world in which the government doesn't do these things. And so I want to begin tonight by going over some of these things. The word libertarian has, of course, been used more and more in recent years, and it describes what I think most people want more of, and that is more control over their own lives. And, of course, in order to get that, they're going to have to have smaller government. Put simply, libertarians want you to be free. Free to live your life as you think best, not as George Bush or John Kerry thinks is best for you. We want you to keep every dollar you earn, spend it, save it, give it away as you think best, not as the politicians decide. We want you to be free to raise your children by your values, not those of faraway bureaucrats who see your child as uh, some little soldier in their crusade for a better world. We want your privacy to be complete so that you're not exposed to politicians and bureaucrats who think that the greater good of the country gives them the right to snoop into your bank account or read your letters or emails and monitor your life. We want you to be free to say no. Say no to busybodies who are sure they know better than you how to run your life or who believe that just one more law will solve some giant social problem, even if it turns your life upside down. Now, libertarians disagree with each other, of course, on some issues, but I think they're pretty unanimous on the critical points. Number one, government is far too big and must be reduced dramatically. Number two, it is wrong. It is both unfair and harmful for government to stop a willing buyer and a willing seller from doing business with each other. And it is wrong for the government to intervene in your personal life. Number three, it is wrong to try to solve social problems by force. And all government programs are force. And if you don't believe that, then call in and we'll give you some examples and a further explanation. Number four, most of today's social problems were caused or worsened by the government's interference in the first place. And we can solve those problems by reducing government, not by giving it more power. And I think that most libertarians would share my dream of a free society. And that dream is simply this. In a libertarian America, you will pay no, no federal income, estate, or gift tax. Because a government limited to the Constitution will be small enough to get by on today's tariffs and excise taxes. No one will force you to pay 15% of your income to a fraudulent retirement scheme like Social Security. Every dollar you earn will be yours to spend, to save, to give away as you see fit. Your neighborhood will be safe because government will no longer foster a criminal black market in drugs. The nightmare of prohibition will finally be over. You can choose your own experts to help you decide which products are safe, effective, and beneficial for you. Federal regulation will no longer run up the price of everything you buy, hold down the wages you earn, or keep life-saving medicines out of your reach. In a libertarian America, the federal government will obey all ten articles of the Bill of Rights, not just the politicians' favorites. Any federal employee who violates the Bill of Rights will be subject to censure, dismissal, or even prosecution. Your person and property will be safe from arbitrary searches and seizures, and your right to protect yourself, your family, and your home with a weapon will never be compromised in any way whatsoever. You won't have to fear that your children will fight and die in some other country's war or that terrorists will target your city. A libertarian government will mind its own business, make no enemies abroad, and rely for peace on a strong defense against both missiles and invasion, rather than trying to rule the world with a strong offense. Freed of the income tax, you'll be better able to support your church or your favorite cause. Politicians will no longer be able to feign compassion by taking your money and giving it to politically connected organizations and causes. Freed of the income tax, you can use your own money to enroll your child in any private or religious school that meets your standards and values. You will control your children's education completely, and they'll no longer be prisoners of the educational bureaucracy. And in a really libertarian society, one that permeates not just the federal government but state and local governments, government will have nothing to do with the education of your child. 
You will not pay property taxes to bureaucrats who will then decide on what is best for your child. You will keep that money, and you will spend it where you think best. You will decide what kind of education your child should have, and you will be able to shop around and get a custom-made education precisely meeting your values and your standards. And, of course, competition, real competition, not voucher-like competition, but real competition will make sure that your child will have access to safe schools, to schools that provide the kind of education you want for your child. The government will no longer have anything to do with health care, which means that health insurance prices will not go through the roof because health insurance companies won't be forced to load up the policies with a lot of uh, conditions that you may not be interested in. Your doctor will probably make house calls again because he'll no longer be spending his time filling out forms for the government. A hospital stay might take a week's pay like it did 50 years ago instead of a, a month or three months or five months pay like it does today. Government will no longer be able to dictate to doctors, to hospitals, to nurses, to insurance companies. And as a result, you will have the pick of the best that there is. Well, that's what I see as a libertarian America. Of course, what we have today is as far away from that almost as you can possibly get. It's certainly the farthest away from it that we've ever been in American history. The Democrats and Republicans in Washington are mud wrestling over such incidental, trivial things as vouchers, medical savings accounts, dividing up the loot that they've taken from the tobacco companies, posturing about guns, claiming to make America a drug-free zone, and even determining the size of your toilet, for God's sakes. So I hope you'll take a step back from politics as usual and ask yourself what you really want. Will anything the politicians are doing today change your life significantly for the better? Will it make much difference if your income tax bill changes by $50 a year or even by $500 a year? Will even changing to a different tax system reduce the terrible load you have to carry so long as government continues to grow? Do you really believe the political posturing over morality will actually improve the climate in your child's school or in your community? Do you think replacing one party's education scheme or health care scheme with that of another will help your child learn more? I don't think so. But these are the battles. These are the squabbling over spoils that has been Washington's real business for the past 50 years. The real issue is, do we honor liberty in this country the way the Founding Fathers tried to do, or are we resigned to having government make the most intimate decisions of our lives? Can you imagine the government deciding how big your toilet can be? In 1994, Congress outlawed toilet tanks with the traditional three and a half gallon capacity and decreed by force that 1.6 gallon toilets must be installed in all new homes meaning that the toilets installed now are less than half the capacity of the ones before and the penalty for installing an older full-size tank is a twenty five hundred dollar fine now if you've got a government that can do that you've got a government that can do anything it can put you in jail and throw away the key and not even give you access to an attorney or the right to confront your accusers or anything else, just as is happening in Guantanamo today. So the point is that what we have today is just about as far as you can get from libertarian America. And we are never going to change America for the better by embroiling ourselves in these political battles that are going on. Because no matter how they compete and no matter what they say and no matter who wins on any issue, government continues to grow and liberty continues to shrink. And so we have to ignore the superficial issues that they argue about. We have to ignore the differences in the two old parties. And somehow we have to work to build the kind of society that most non-politicians really want, the kind that I've described, the kind our founding fathers had in mind for us, an end to a $2 trillion government, a uh, return to a government tied down from mischief by the chains of the Constitution, as Thomas Jefferson put it, a society governed by individual liberty and personal responsibility rather than governed by the likes of Bill Clinton, George Bush, Trent Lott, John Kerry, or Teddy Kennedy. Ah, oh, but isn't this just dreaming? How in the world can we hope to make the extraordinary changes I've described? Well, even if I am just dreaming, the first all-important question that must be asked is, do you want it? Is this the kind of society you want to live in? Do you want smaller government? Do you want to be free of the income tax? Do you want to be free of the Social Security tax? Do you want your privacy back? Do you want your neighborhood to be free of criminal drug dealers? Do you want a free market in education, a free market in health care, a free market in charity? Do you want an end to a government that goes around the world telling everybody else how they must live and threatening death and destruction on those who resist? If you could push a button right now and make the things I've described happen, would you do it? That's the all-important first question. Would you do it if you could? Would you want it if you could get it? No, I don't have any grand plan in mind that's going to change all this in the next few years. I can't even guarantee you that it can happen, but I can see how it could happen. I can see how it is possible that we could turn this country around. Lord knows we've got a far, far better message than they do. We are the only people who are suggesting 
to your friends and neighbors that they could live a life without the income tax, with lower health care prices, with an education system that they could be happy with. We are the only ones that have these things to offer, a peaceful America free from terrorism, a peaceful America that would always be well protected because it would focus on defense rather than offense. We're the only ones offering this, so it is possible. But the important question is, do you want it? And if you do, then the next step is to quit supporting the people who are making government bigger. You are never going to get what you want by giving your endorsement to somebody who is in Washington or the state capitol or city hall or the school board or any government office trying to make government bigger. I don't care if he seems to be three shades better than his opponent or let's say three shades less worse. I don't care what his virtues seem to be. If he is willing to vote for more government, if he's willing to vote to violate the Constitution, if he is willing to ignore the Bill of Rights and you support him, then you are doing exactly the opposite of what you have to do. I've mentioned before on this show that you really have only two alternatives as far as elections are concerned. Either vote libertarian or don't vote at all. Any other vote you cast will be interpreted as an endorsement of big government. No matter what your intentions, no matter what your motive, that's how it will be received. There is nothing wrong with not voting. There is nothing wrong with voting for the person who loses. Let us now see what's going on in the USA. Let's talk with David in Savannah, Georgia. Good evening, David. Good evening, Harry. How what's, are you? I'm just fine. What's up tonight? Uh, thank you for taking my call. Um, I'm calling, uh, first of all, I should warn you, as I'm, I'm an ex-libertarian. I don't know how many ex-libertarians <laughs> you get. Um, but I'm calling... Um, well, I've before, been... before you go on, my curiosity is overwhelming. Are you now uh, a prohibitionist, a socialist, a nudist, a vegetarian, a Republican, a Democrat? What are you now? I'm a fully paid-up member of the Lunatic Party. <laughs> oh, well, that could be any of the ones I just mentioned. <laughs> yeah, all of the above, right? Yes. <laughs> anyway, um, the reason I'm calling um, is I've been listening to some of your archive shows, um, and I'm sort of surprised, actually, that no one's brought this up before. Um, and it's concerning 911. And uh, I understand... Um, you're, you're making basically a political po point about what has been called blowback, uh, you know, the sure. melting in other countries and uh, the unintended consequences of that, and using 911 as an example of that. And um, for, for a long time, I believed the same thing. Uh, but the more I started looking at what I personally call the, the hard evidence of 911, the more I'm drawn to conclude um, that it's nothing to do with Muslims in flying in planes, in fact. And... Uh, it took me a long time to come to this, because, like I say, I feel, when you say these things, the first time I told someone about it, you're not the first person I've said this to, um, but you listen to yourself speaking, and you sound, you say, oh, no, I sound like a lunatic, I sound like a conspiracy theorist. Well, we're all ears, what is your theory? <clears throat> well, I'm not, uh, I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, and it's not, it's, my conclusions are mine, they're nobody else's, although I have seen similar things out there. Um, but I, it's based on what I call evidence, and the, the only evidence that someone like myself has is photographic evidence, and it's basically evidence that's out there in the public domain uh, and has been ever since the event. I'm talking particularly of the, uh, the Norday brothers' video, the, what's called the Fireman's video, and also um, the, the stills from the Norday video, which are on, were on CNN, particularly of Flight 175. There's a famous one of it angling into just before it hits the South Tower. Uh, uh -huh. And what is the conclusion of all this? Let me jump ahead. Is the conclusion that it wasn't really the planes that did all the damage, that well, there was more to it than that? Yeah, I don't want to take up all of your time here, but the first thing I did was I looked, uh, not at that video, but what happened was I went to look at the, I heard about this French site where they go into the Pentagon um, attack, mm -hmm. and uh, they say basically that uh, it wasn't a plane. There was no flight uh, plane going into that building, no uh, whatever the airline was going into that uh -huh. building. And I looked at that and I said, you've got to be kidding me. This is a load of So I looked at it for six months and I basically dismissed it. And then what happened was, I saw this uh, still from the Norday Brothers video of the Flight 175 angling into that tower, as I just said, and it was pointed out that there's an object on the underside of that that doesn't belong there. And I looked at that and I said, uh, you can, I can send you um, the photograph if you like. I've, um, I've seen it on the Internet. Yeah, um, anyway, I looked at that and I said, well, that can't be. That's got to be the shadow from the engine on the right, the right engine of that plane. So I dismissed that as well. And then what happened was uh, this um, video came out in black, I think it was in black and white, of two Czech immigrants who are all Czech immigrants, or they're on vacation in New York, and they shot video of it, and they didn't even know what they had on the video until they got back to Czechoslovakia. And anyway, they have a shot of the same flight, 175, coming in um, uh, into the South Tower from another angle. And it's, lo and behold, it's clear as day. And the photo was actually very small, printed on uh, the New York Times front page, and it's been on the Internet. And it shows very clearly that there's a large object that shouldn't be there on the underside of that plane. Which leads me to conclude, um, uh, then I, I saw that and said, well, that doesn't make sense. I'd never, I'd never go on a plane that had three engines. I saw this huge object next to the fuselage on it. Um, so then I went back and looked at the, um, the whole theory on the Pentagon again. And then I'm starting, now I'm starting to think, this is not what we're being told. And so <clears throat> if you look at that evidence, and everybody can draw their own conclusions from it, 
it's obvious to me that the government knows a lot more about this than it's letting on, it, it knows about And my conclusion, my personal conclusion, is that the government is it either allowed it to happen or it's directly involved in the whole thing. I mean, you can get off into the whole uh, fact that none of the... Nobody took off, none of the Air Force planes took off to intercept those flights when the transponders initially went off. Uh, yes, in well... a heavily militarized uh, area of the United States. Sure, the nature of politics is such that even if what the government has said is substantially true, there is no doubt that they have embellished it tremendously, they have exaggerated it, they have uh, omitted important facts, they've done other things. The question is, how much have they omitted? Is, is it as gigantic as Pearl Harbor's deception was, or is it just a lot of minor embellishments? But it is impossible for politicians to just simply tell the truth. They've always got to uh, find some way to dress it up in order to be able to point with pride or view with alarm or to be able to show you that they're the only ones that can protect you from evil and so on. And I, re I really don't know where all this is going to go and it may be that two or three or five or even ten years from now all of the truth will come out and i don't know what that truth will be and i'm not betting on any particular outcome right. but but you're not a lunatic to be skeptical i mean you are lied to day after day by politicians now well, I'm to lie. well it may turn it may turn out that you are wrong about this but it is yeah. still not wrong to be skeptical i understand that i could be wrong all i can do is draw my conclusions based on the best evidence that i have in front of me sure and you're not getting very good evidence from the government i no, understand that uh, uh, okay well, some of their anyway i guess my point is that um I, I'm not sure that it's a good example. I, I can't believe that libertarians in general, because libertarians are generally very curious people, and I cannot believe that no one's brought it up before. Oh, I can tell you that there are libertarians that are bringing it up. Yeah. I'm not one of them because but, I don't want to get away from what I think is the main issue. Whatever the truth about 9-11 is, the fact of the matter remains that our government is provoking problems all over the world by its interference, by its bullying, by its intimidation, by its you're either with us or against us philosophy, and that's what's got to end. And what we have to do is to reduce government so to the point where it is so small that it cannot bring about something like 9-11, either by uh, kicking a hornet's nest overseas or by some malfeasance here at home, right. some manipulation, some evil design or anything else. And that's always the answer, is to make government so small that the politicians cannot uh, do this to us, even if they're outright crooks before they get to Washington. Yes, I, I understand your point. Um, like I, as I said previously, I am an ex-libertarian. I don't actually believe that that is possible anymore. I, I, I think everything that you say you're complaining about, is just, that is the nature of the beast. That's what governments do. And sure. everything that libertarians say, or oh, it shouldn't be doing this, it shouldn't be doing that, that's, if you want a government, you cannot constrict it. You cannot have constitutional limitations on it. It will always find a way around them. Well, let, let me interrupt you, because we're going to have to move on. The Founding Fathers did a far better job than anybody had done up to that point in history. And it was not perfect. That's why we have the government we have today. But it lasted for decades in a much better shape than any peoples in the world had experienced before. There is no reason not to believe that the next time we could make it even better. It still won't be perfect, and it's still, as long as there is a government, you have that fear, a dangerous servant and the fearful master. And so it will still be a problem, but it can be better, and we might be able to give our children or our grandchildren a generation or two of freedom. And during that time, people may learn how to get along without any government at all, and we might have a society that is far better than anything even we can dream of. But I don't know. The important point is that we shouldn't give up on this uh, if we really believe that liberty is the best way. David, thank you for calling. And thank you, Harry. You bet. We'll go now to Nevada and talk with Bill. Good evening, Bill. Hi, Harry. How are you doing? I'm just fine. What's on your mind tonight? Oh, just two questions. Um, first question is, if we did have a libertarian president, how long do you think it would take to get the government down to uh, the limits that you described, and how many presidents would it take to do that? I think that it could be much, much faster than you would expect. First of all, if you, if you did elect a libertarian president, by definition, the people would be behind you. And this would change considerably the attitude of people in Congress if they wanted to stay in Congress and get reelected two years later. They would have to go along with a lot that the president asked for. Secondly, there is so much that the president can do that does not require the consent of Congress. And if we had only had somebody, for instance, as Ronald Reagan pictured himself when he was running for president, we could have accomplished a lot of this. We could have ended the war on drugs. We could have brought all the troops home from overseas. We could have forced government employees to live by the Bill of Rights. We could have torn pages out of the Federal Register. I mean, there are tens of thousands of pages there, and they're all put in there by the administration, not necessarily by laws of Congress. And all of this could be done without even the consent of Congress. So there's a great deal that can happen, and I believe that within two years or so after you have a libertarian president, you could have a government that was no more than 100 or $200 billion, as opposed to the $2.4 trillion government we have today. Does that answer the question? Oh, yes, it does. Yeah, it's very clear. Um, second question is, uh, I'm a libertarian and also a member of the military. Um, if all troops were recalled from the 130-some uh, countries that they're in right now, uh, would you feel uh, a necessity to downsize the size of the military, uh, reducing the manpower and so forth? 
Well, I must admit, I've never really given much thought to that. Do you know how many people are in the four branches of the service now? Uh, not as I know. I, I don't really know, so I can't really tell you. One of the problems that we have, in addition to the defense budget, there are all sorts of military expenditures that are in the Department of Energy and a lot of other federal parts of the administration. And it has been estimated that the total cost in the military, that includes weaponry and everything else, is well over $600 billion. And I believe that this is because the entire military structure is geared to offense now. It is geared to being able to wipe out other countries, to be able to devastate other countries in a war, and practically nothing is devoted to defense. There's no missile defense to protect us from incoming missiles. 19 guys with box cutters were able to kill 3,000 people in New York, and these things are happening because there's practically no defense. If you focused on defense, I don't believe that the military budget in its entirety would need to be more than 40 or $50 billion, and I may be grossly overstating that. So how much this would involve downsizing the personnel, I can't say. All right, let's talk now with Kayleen in Massachusetts. Good evening, Kayleen. Hello, Mr. Brown. Good to hear from you. Yeah, you, I've, I've talked to you before. Yes. I've emailed you before. Um, I have to say, I've listened to your show for several weeks, and tonight's beginning monologue was the best that you've ever done. Well, thank you. I absolutely agree with every word you've said. Well, good. And, um, it just, uh, it, the small government is um, the answer. Um, to, court, uh, to quote Carla Howell, uh, who ran for representative here in Massachusetts, where I live. Sure. Small government is beautiful. <laughs> yes. Yes. And um, also... Um, uh, I don't want to take up a lot of your time, uh, but uh, the Second Amendment. You, were, we were, uh, you had a couple of callers talking about the war mm-hmm. and a couple of um, people who serve in this, um, the war or veterans or whatever. In the military. Yes. And um, I just want to say the Second Amendment states not only that we have a well-regulated militia, meaning that we defend our country not to get involved in foreign wars. Yes, right? of course. Of course. Absolutely. Yes, uh, and, and in fact, Jefferson and uh, Washington both warned very, very strongly against getting involved in any foreign entanglements whatsoever. No alliances with Britain or France or anybody else, and by all means, don't get involved in the eternal wars of Europe where jealousies and reven- resentments and desires for revenge and so forth are just perpetual. They are always at war with each other, and although it has seemed a little more peaceful in Central Europe the last uh, few decades, the fact is that for centuries those countries have been at war with each other, and the United States getting involved in the First World War over there, just open the floodgates to where we are now at perpetual war in order to bring about perpetual peace, which of course never happens. You're absolutely right. And um, the founding fathers are rolling over in their graves over us getting involved in foreign wars. Yes, as Mrs. Malaprop would say, if Thomas Jefferson were alive today, he'd be turning over in his grave. Oh, my goodness, you're right. And um, the other part of the Second Amendment, and um, which is gun control laws, which completely stinks. The uh, right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. It, 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 no longer do we have uh, the right to keep and bear arms. To Oh, you do, but you must obey all the rules and right, regulations right. that are set so down by words, the government. So in other words, it's no longer a right. It's a privilege. Sure. Which the big government has given us. Right. A privilege. Which can you be modified at any moment. You have to have a license, and in some states you have to register your gun. And um, in self-defense, what are you supposed to do? I'm a woman. What if somebody comes to rape me? I have to have a license to have a gun. I have to go to my police chief who says, well, you may or may not have a gun. This is ridiculous. Sure. Yes, is and that, that, right is, that is not consistent, which shall not be infringed. Exactly. And I love your show, and I won't take up any more of your time. Thank well, you very much, Mr. Brown. Call any time and take up the time, Kayleen. Always right. glad to hear from you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Right. You bet. And right now we're going to hear from Paul in Arizona. Good evening, Paul. Oh, hi, Mr. Brown. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Hey, um, I want to get your thoughts on an issue that I never thought would become an issue again in my lifetime, and that's the military draft. And uh, just the last week or so, I've been hearing a lot of talk about the possibility of bringing that back. And uh, for, I, I was born in 1966, so it wouldn't affect me directly, but I, I do have younger relatives that I'm really worried about, relatives in their early and mid-teens right now. And my question is, um, it's basically a three-part question. Um, number one, what do you think the likelihood is that uh, the draft will be reinstated? And uh, number two, what the, by what process could that be reinstated? And also, I'd like to know how much of an impact the president has in that whole decision. Well, let's start with the last one. The president, of course, his impact is that he pushes for it. He starts giving speeches around the country and pointing out how we should all be serving our country and doing what we can because our freedom is at stake here. It it is interesting. I noticed that a segment on CNN the other night was called The Cost of Freedom, and it went into all the different costs that were being incurred in the Iraqi situation, meaning that we're over there defending our freedom. Nobody's threatened our freedom. Hussein never intended to come after this country, but somehow or other our freedom's at stake. And this is the uh, pitch that will probably be given. As As far as how does it come about, Congress just simply passes a bill, and both houses concur on it, and President Bush signs it. If President Bush were to veto it, of 
which there are about one chance in 10 million. Uh, if he were to veto it, then Congress would have to again vote on it and get a two-thirds majority in both houses. But it would be a slam dunk, of course, uh, if Congress approved it. How likely is it to be approved? I'd say right now there's about a 50-50 chance because the war on terrorism is not going to be over. President Bush says we're winning the war on terrorism. But how can we be winning a war that is slated to last for many years into the future? When you're winning a war, it means you're getting close to bringing it to conclusion. It's interesting that you bring this up because I have a note here on my desk, and I should interrupt myself to say that another thing that we don't have tonight because of my lack of Internet connection is on the page of radio links. There are no links for tonight's broadcast, but I will put some up on Monday. One of them is an article about the draft, and Senator Chuck Hagel, a Republican, of course, said, quote, there's not an American that doesn't understand what we are engaged in today and what the prospects are for the future. Why shouldn't we ask all of our citizens to bear some responsibility and pay some price? I saw and, that quote. Yes, and there. referring to restoring compulsory military service, he said this would force, quote, our citizens to understand the intensity and depth of challenges we face. Now, it's very interesting. Why shouldn't we ask all of our citizens to bear some responsibility and pay some price? Well, he's not asking all of our citizens. He's asking those from 18 to 26 years old or 18 to 30 years old. He's not going to go off to Iraq and pay some price. <laughs> he's not even going to go to the blood bank and lose a pint of blood, let alone gallons of it, by having his insides ripped out by some mortar fire or RPG or something else. They always say you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. But, of course, it's always somebody else's eggs that are going to be broken, never the person who's doing the talking, and despite how many eggs are broken, the omelet never materializes. And this whole thing about the draft is a very good example of how one government program fails and thereby provides the justification for another. Because the Iraqi thing has not turned out the way they promised it, it would, it is now a justification for reinstating slavery in this country. And that is what the draft is. It is slavery, pure well, and simple. I think it's one of the most insidious forms of slavery. And I, I, I was wondering, do you think... Yes, yeah, but let me interrupt you there, because you were about to change the subject. And you made a very, very important point. The slaves in the South before the Civil War may have had to put in 12-hour days, but no one ever shoved them out into a battleground and said, here, we're going going to risk your life. We're going to see you either kill some other people or you're going to get killed yourself. You're right. It is the most insidious form of slavery there is. Now, pardon me for interrupting you. Go ahead with what oh, you're going to say. Do you think this will be uh, an election year issue? I mean, do you think it will come up during the campaign or, or do you think the politicians will try to downplay it knowing that it would, uh, you know, it could likely cost uh, you know, either one the election possibly? Do you think maybe uh, you know, George W. Bush will just kind of, you know, try to avoid the issue? But if he's reelected, then not having to worry about being reelected for another you know, campaign, then do you think it's likely that uh, you know, the issue will come up? Well, first of all, I think you're right that Bush would try to avoid this issue as long as he can, avoid it publicly until after the election. But should it come out, Bush would probably say, I have no plans to do so, but I would not hesitate to do so if I thought it were necessary. And then when reporters ask John Kerry how he feels about this, surprise, surprise, he won't object to it either. He won't say that, no, under no circumstances would I ever reinstate the draft. He would probably say that would be a last resort, but if, if it were necessary, then yes, we should do so. And he would probably attach to it some typical garbage, some empty rhetoric about how we all have to pull together and do our share, and we all have an obligation to this country. We all have to give back something to this country. I love that phrase. Give back something to the country. By God, whatever you got in this country, you got because you worked for it, because you gave somebody something of value. You don't owe anybody anything. There is nothing to give back. And, and of course, the politicians will never um, ask their own sons or daughters to give back. Heavens um, no. Yeah, well, Mr. Brown, thanks so much for taking my call. Oh, thank you for the call and check in with us from time to time. All right, let's talk with David in Utah. David, good evening. Hi, uh, Harry. I'm, I just want to tell you that I really appreciate listening to your program. And uh, my son and I, we've, we've been just in recent times have become uh, libertarians. And uh, we want to let you know that you have truly enlightened us with a lot of information and understanding. However, with enlightenment comes more questions. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a couple of questions that we would like to ask you. Now, I'm going to ask you the first one, and would it be all right if I put my son on the phone to ask you the second one? Uh, well, of course. Okay. He, he's old enough to talk, I take it. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, he just turned four. <laughs> uh, and you've been discussing politics with him for three and, uh, years. And I have, yes. <laughs> but uh, now he's, he's 23 years old, so he's, uh, he's quite aware about what's going on. Good. Uh, but the, the first question that has recently come up in our discussions about different uh, issues is the bankruptcy laws. What are the opinions or what is the position of a, of a libertarian regarding the bankruptcy laws here in the United States? Well, I don't know that there is anything in the very, very extensive Libertarian Party platform about the bankruptcy laws. I can only give you my opinion, and since it's a subject that I have not heard discussed very much at Libertarian meetings or among Libertarians, uh, you have to understand that I'm only speaking for myself. But I do not believe laws serve any purpose, and a bankruptcy law merely entitles someone to 
get away from his obligations that he entered into. And sometimes we make terrible mistakes in life, and that's very, very unfortunate that we do by getting too far in debt or something else. But the answer is not to go to the government and have the government use its guns and its power and its ability to fine or imprison people to go to your creditors and say, you are shielded from having to pay your debts. Now, if you can't pay your debts and you are facing an enormous burden of trying to get out from under debts that maybe came from uh, enormous medical costs or something else which seemed to be something beyond your control, the best that you should be able to hope for is to be able to talk to your creditors and come to some settlement and to some way of taking care of it. But using the government to force other people to pay the consequences of your mistakes is never going to solve problems. And any time you do it and you even specify that this can only be used by people in great need, then all you are doing is encouraging people to demonstrate great need because uh, – it may apply to begin with to people who have had just plain terrible luck, but at the end of the line, it's going to appeal to every shyster or sharpie in the country who wants to avoid having to pay for the things that he wants to have in life. Is that making any sense? No, it, no, it makes uh, every every bit of sense in the world, and uh, certainly, I, you know, our thoughts along those, those same lines have been uh, pretty much the same. However, well, but, you know, just uh, you're, you've just kind of reaffirmed. Uh, uh, our own feelings regarding it as a matter. Yes, and, uh, it, it, and it would be very easy to fashion a law that says that this bankruptcy protection can only be used by people in the following circumstances. But I can guarantee you within five years, those circumstances would have doubled or tripled or quadrupled in size, and meaning that instead of there being only three possible ways you could use the bankruptcy laws, there would be a dozen or two dozen. It would just keep growing and growing the number of people who could take advantage of them. And we are talking with David in Utah and about to talk with David's son. Yeah, and Harry, his, his name is Joshua, so I'm going to turn him over to you right now. All right, good evening, Joshua. Hi, Harry Brown. Um, I just uh, wanted to ask you, I've been learning uh, some things about uh, the federal government and uh, its jurisdictions, and I was wondering, does the Bill of Rights and other any other federal laws um, pertain only to uh, the federal jurisdictions, or like federal territories, or do they also pertain to the states and state citizens? Well, prior to the Civil War, it was assumed that the Bill of Rights applied only to the federal government and that every state in the country at that particular time had its own constitution. And this was the federal system. And the idea about it was that if you lived in a state like Utah or Georgia or Pennsylvania and the government there was too tyrannical for your taste, you could move to Nevada or Alabama or New Jersey or some other nearby state and the states would have to compete with each other and that would serve to keep the state governments in line. With the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was passed and it has become pretty much the prevailing wisdom that the 14th Amendment of the Constitution applies the Bill of Rights to state governments and that's why the Supreme Court will hear cases that seem to be only of a state character and therefore say that states cannot prohibit freedom of speech or other things of that sort. I tend to the older version of this whole thing because I feel that a federal government that is strong enough to impose its way upon the states for good purposes will of course be strong enough to impose its way on the states for bad purposes. And the worst temptation in the world politically is to get the government to do something you think is good for society. Because in doing so, you give the government the power to do what is bad for society. And the very power itself attracts to it the kind of people that are going to use that power for the worst possible purposes. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does, and I agree. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much for calling, uh, Joshua, and to your father, David, also. We appreciate it. And now let's go to California and talk with Eli. Good evening, Eli. Hello, Mr. Brown. I'm really enjoying your uh, show over the Internet. I have one question. I believe in the uh, liberal. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce the word yet. I just uh, heard you. Uh, it, it's really a great idea because we have a big government, but uh, I have to vote either Republican or Democrat, depending on which which party represents a smaller part, uh, smaller government. Because otherwise, I, I believe I'm going to be wasting my vote, and this way I can send a, a message to uh, both parties that uh, whoever has a smaller government will will get my vote. Well, wait a second. How do you know which party is going to give you the smaller government? That's why I asked you. Do you know which party usually <laughs> represents a smaller government? Or? There, there is no way to know. George Bush, when he campaigned in the year 2000, said, I believe in limited government. I believe in smaller government. I don't believe in nation building around the world. And I think that we should understand that not all problems can be solved by the federal government. Now, here he is across the world, nation building, bringing democracy to Iraq, he thinks. Uh, he is telling Major League Baseball that they better solve the steroid problem pretty quick or he's going to do it for them. He has brought the federal government into the prescription drug business. Yeah. And so what is the point? You listen to that guy and you say, well, I have to vote for the one smaller government. Between him and Al Gore, you had to believe that George Bush was for smaller government. But Bush has, and his Republican Congress have increased government far faster than Clinton did, even in his first two years with the Democratic Congress. So the, the yeah. point is that you don't know which one, and 
the very act of voting for him is not sending the message you want. It is sending the message that you agree with whatever it is that he is promoting, whether that is a war in Iraq or a national health care uh, system or whatever it is, he's going to take your vote as an endorsement of every new government program that he talked about in the campaign or in the case of Bush has inflicted on us over the last four years. Exactly. I, I believe Bush has gone over his head in Iraq. We all knew we had to go in Afghanistan. We had a, a big job there. I think he just... Uh, uh, went by uh, the wrong facts. Uh, he, he's like a misinformed uh, man about the whole thing in Iraq. And uh, we're stuck there. We have to finish the job. And uh, we, we, we Bush should uh, work with the, uh, the allies and the UN to give us a hand over there, fix Iraq and get out. Otherwise, he should step down and let someone else take care of it if he can do uh, do what he's supposed to do. Do you think he's inclined to do that? I, I don't think so. I don't think, I think he's do you think he's in way. inclined to step down, I mean? Uh, I don't believe so, because he's stubborn and uh, he doesn't even admit his mistakes. And he loves being president. He loves being able to say, my job is to lead the country. My job is to bring uh, peace to the Middle East. My job is to solve the AIDS problem in Africa and so forth. He part loves of, that. Part of his problem is, I think he believes that Iraq is Japan. Iraq is, is not a developed, civilized country, and people are so religious fanatics over there. It will take time for them to, 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 to find democracy. It's not like overnight. I just want to ask you, you said that we all know that we had to go into Afghanistan. I'm afraid I'm not one of those who knows that. I be really believe that you cannot count on government to do anything. And we get into the wrong discussions when we say, do we have a responsibility to go into Afghanistan or Iraq? Do we need to retaliate? Do we need to do this? Do we need to do that? Because government doesn't do anything right. We may think that it would be nice if government, for instance, got rid of all the drugs in the country that are uh, causing problems. We might think that it would be a good thing if the federal government could make our schools run properly. We might think that it would be a good thing that it would discourage terrorism by bombing Afghanistan or that it might bring democracy to Iraq. But none of these things will happen. It just simply is never going to happen the way they tell us it's going to. And right now, Afghanistan is beset by civil war. It is an absolute mess, and people would be talking about the terrible things that are going on in Afghanistan if their attention were not diverted to Iraq, because nothing has worked out the way it was supposed to in Afghanistan any more than it has in Iraq. Yes, uh, that's because we uh, did not concentrate on Afghanistan. We went to uh, Iraq, which is like another problem. Uh, the United Nations could have dealt with Iraq, and uh, we could have done our job in Afghanistan. We had to take care of this guy because he was after us. Saddam was contained in so many ways. He, half of his country was occupied by the UN, and uh, that's why I believe Bush went over his head in, uh, in Iraq, and uh, he had really screwed up because we had a chance to unite the whole world against uh, terrorism and isolate Osama and his followers uh, to, uh, in the, uh, to Afghanistan only and just work there and took care of that. <laughs> but you see, that's what I'm saying. They always screw up. It isn't just Bush. It's Clinton. It's Reagan. It's Bush Sr. It's Harry Truman. It's Franklin Roosevelt. It's Woodrow Wilson. It's Abraham Lincoln. They all screw up. And you're not the dictator. You, you can sit there and say, this is how they should do it. If they would only do A and then do B, but they're going to do X and then Y and then L and then G, and they're not going to do things in the proper order. They're not going to do things with the proper priorities. They're going to do them in keeping with whoever has the most political influence, because whenever you turn anything over to the government, whether it's a military matter, a scientific matter, a commercial matter, a medical matter, financial matter, it now becomes a political issue to be decided by whoever has the most political influence. And that is never going to be you, Eli, and it's never going to be me, Harry. So it doesn't do us any good to say that we could have done some good in Afghanistan or we could have done some good anywhere else because it simply is not going to happen the way you want it to. Am I making uh, any sense? Yes, you are perfect. Uh, I, I really thank you for the show. It's very informative. And I wish we could do something about influencing uh, you know, our decision to make the government uh, better because uh, we are headed the wrong way, and this is very dangerous because uh, we are losing our allies and we are making more enemies. Of course. And, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. And, yes. Eli, I thank can't give much. I can't give you a perfect answer right now, but just don't give up hope. No, uh, I won't. Thank and, you so much. And let's, let's wait, and, and maybe we're going to find the answer somewhere along the way here. Maybe, yeah. maybe the answer is in Ohio right now, and yeah. De Dennis has the key to it. So let's go to Ohio and talk to Dennis and see what's up. Well, I'm afraid you, I was afraid you were going to lay this on. <laughs> Come on, deliver, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I think the odds are against me. Um, the, the problem, the problem seems to be over and over again that that we we look to the thing that causes all of our problems for a solution, and it doesn't know a way to do anything without spending even more money, which in turn screws things up in some other way that we have to deal with further down the line. How that true? Doesn't, that doesn't matter whether you're talking about agricultural policy, drug policy, foreign policy. It's the same deal. And uh, actually, the reason I was I called up tonight was to see if if uh, maybe libertarians could think out there. I contacted Fee about a year ago, emailed him, asking for some recommendations for stuff for children. But um, I, I don't really know of any great books, you know, to counteract or counterbalance the stuff that is plentiful in every library that you walk into everywhere. What age children are you thinking of? Oh, uh, say ten to thirteen. Mm -hmm. You know, they're ready to, they're thinking about history. I mean, in my case, you know, my children are around me, so they, they, they have a little more exposure to other ideas. But, sure. 
But if you look at uh, you know the, the sweeping history of the 20th century, for example, you learn all the usual stuff that we all we all know about Franklin Roosevelt and <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson. Sure. And how they did all these how they did all these great things for us. But is there are are you aware of anything out there that um, that that has any anything you know geared toward children that has you know a more classical liberal or or you know laissez faire or sure I understand. I really have not paid a lot of attention to that aspect of it. I do know of a history series by Clarence Carson called The Making, I think it's called The Making of America, and at the break I'll go get it off my bookshelf and give the proper name, and because I don't have an Internet connection tonight, I can't put it on the Radio Links page, but I will do that on Monday, so that if you want to check on Monday, I'll have the link to where this is available. It's a, The Making of America is a series of about four or five books. I would say that they were probably written for junior high and high school consumption. Okay. I've, seen it, I've seen this over the years, but I always assumed it was a conservative well, it is uh, conservative to a certain extent, but it certainly includes a lot of information that is not going to be in school textbooks. And, and when I say information, I also mean a slant, you know, a perspective, a way of looking at these things. It doesn't look at it as though government saved us from the Great Depression and government saved the world for democracy in World War One. And Lincoln uh, just okay. had no other motive but the, the pure motive of wanting to free the slaves and so forth and so on. And it, it isn't a perfect answer to what it is you're looking for, but it's a lot better than what I've seen of uh, college, of, of high school and junior high school textbooks. So I take it he's not a conservative um, like uh, the former Republican Speaker of the House who oh, no. helped, helped Frank Lund Roosevelt as one of his idols. And... Oh, no, 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 not like Newt Gingrich and not like uh, William, is it William Bennett? Yeah, Bennett, yeah. yeah. and so on. No, no this, I, I don't know that Clarence Carson would call himself or did call himself, if he's no longer alive, call himself a libertarian. I kind of doubt that he would, but mm -hmm. it certainly is a b better perspective on history than you would get from the normal textbook. So I, that's the only thing I can uh, help you with. I'm sorry that I don't know more about that. Well, that's that's okay, but you know, just just to throw it out there on the airwaves, that is some area. That is one area where you know, libertarians. I mean, I've been a libertarian, or I don't know if I always call myself a libertarian, but. I yeah, I, I, I understand. And maybe, maybe you know, we have a lot of uh, well-informed people that listen to this show, and maybe somebody will call in yet before the evening's over with some suggestions, so right. be sure to stay tuned for the rest of the show with little time we have left. Well, just one parting shot. We, we spend a lot of time arguing over minutia, over stuff that isn't, isn't very, doesn't seem very real mm -hmm. sometimes. And, you know, if we're going to have an impact on the world, we're going to have to start with some, with some children. I yeah, think. very true. I mean, uh, there's just so much for, for children who are not... You know, pre-thought thoughts, everything packaged for them. I, I well understand. The only thing I can say is that I'm a little too old to count on the next couple of generations <laughs> for saving <laughs> America. I'm a little bit more eager and a little more impatient than that, but I understand what you're saying, and it makes perfect sense. Thanks so much for calling. Okay. I Take appreciate care. it, Dennis. Before we go on, you know, a week or so ago, Marjolis Berga was in town, and Marjolis Berga is the president of GlideRide, our principal sponsor on this show. He and his lovely wife were in town, and Pamela and I had a, about a four-hour lunch with him. And I always enjoy talking with Marjolis because he's a very interesting individual. He is an immigrant, been in the country a little over 20 years, and a wonderful success story, a very intelligent man, and a very well-informed man. And if we had more time, I'd tell you several of the things that he brought up, but just one of them was that he has been to Vietnam recently. You remember Vietnam, <laughs> where they had that war a few years ago? And he couldn't help but say that Vietnam, at least in the south, he did not go to the north, but in the south of Vietnam, he said the market is freer there than it is in the United States. And I had read that about, I think, 10 years ago, that Vietnam had instituted a lot of free market reforms there in order to attract business and that they were thriving there. And while the United States is going away from the free market, Vietnam, its mortal enemy for many years, is going towards the free market. I couldn't help but think those poor South Vietnamese refugees, the boat people. Remember, they left Vietnam. And where did they wind up? They wound up in California, as the governor would say. Those poor people have gone to one of the most regulated areas of the world, California, USA, and what they left behind is moving in the opposite direction towards a free market. The irony of it all is just overwhelming. And, of course, they didn't know when they left Vietnam, and their lives may have been in danger by staying in Vietnam. They may have been of an intellectual class or former government employees or something else who were earmarked to be executed. I don't know, because when the North Vietnamese took over, they were not very kind and gentle towards people. But once they settled in, reality took hold, and they had to make some changes, and they made the changes toward the free market. Another thing that uh, Marshall Asperger pointed pointed out was that it's interesting that people like himself, he's an engineer or a doctor or a lawyer, has to pass an examination, has to have a certain education, has to go through a lot of hoops to prove that he is qualified to be able to do business as a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer or whatever it is. 
But the politicians don't have to pass any tests whatsoever. They don't have to take an examination. They don't have to prove that they've ever even read the Constitution in their lives. They don't even have to prove that they know what the words Bill of Rights mean. They don't have to, to qualify in any way whatsoever, just get enough votes and they're in. And the further irony there is that you don't have to do business with a lawyer. No matter how qualified he is, no matter how carefully he's been screened, you still do not have to do business with him at all. You can just say, no, I don't want to deal with this doctor. I don't want to deal with this lawyer. I don't want this engineer building my house or whatever it may be. But with the politicians who have no qualifications whatsoever, at the point of a gun, you must do business with them. You must pay the taxes that they levy on you. You must abide by the regulations they impose. You must finance the programs that they want to promote to help their political allies, to reward their friends, and to punish their enemies. So the people who have to have the qualifications have no power whatsoever to impose their way on you. The people who have no qualifications can run your life, and there's nothing you can do about it. So isn't that ironic? Let's now talk with Bob in Alabama. Good evening, Bob. Good evening, Harry. Thanks for the call. Sure. I didn't catch the name of the uh, person that called in just a minute ago uh, regarding a um, children? Source, source for material for uh, study guides for the children. Yes. Uh, but I would highly recommend the Richard Mayberry series. Uh, that, uh, it's really designed more for <clears throat> young teenagers. Uh, that's that's and, a very, very good choice. And and through high school. But, uh, you know, whatever happened to Penny Candy, whatever happened to Justice, Thousand-Year War in the Middle East, uh, he has books on World War One, World War Two. Uh, what would Thomas, uh, Thomas Jefferson think about uh, uh, you know today's uh, uh, activity? And it, it includes study guides and everything. It's really a great uh, uh, series of books. I think you can get it all for about a hundred bucks. For I don't know, it's uh, at least a dozen books. books. Yeah, you're no question about that. And the books are formatted as letters to Uncle Eric's nephew. Right. And the nephew, we presume, is somebody in high school. Exactly. And they're very, very well done. And they are excellent books for adults as well. So the fact that we're talking here about a way of helping your children get a perspective on these things is not meant to indicate that you as an adult would not enjoy the books. In fact, one of the very best books he's written, and I, I think the best of all the ones I've read, was Whatever Happened to Justice, which explains the concept of the common law and what governments are supposed to do and how going beyond what they're supposed to do creates all sorts of problems. So I appreciate your reminding me of that. I'm sorry I didn't think of it before. And I will put on Monday, when I have my computer connection back, I will put a link on the radio links page. Just go to harrybrown.org, and right at the top of the home page, you'll see, click here for links to articles and websites mentioned on the show, and go there, and for under today's date, there will be the Mayberry books, the Clarence Carson series, and also the article about bringing back the draft. Now, that isn't what you got on the phone to begin with for, I don't think, Bob, so... Well, no, it wasn't, but uh, I did want to talk about uh, the draft just briefly here before we... Okay, we've got about a minute and a half before we have to sign off. All right, well, I guess I was going to say that I think I would, in fact, support the draft if we you know we were assured that after we went through this indoctrination and we uh, were taught how to use rifles and we were sent home with our bullets and our guns that we would not ever ever have to go fight in a foreign war and that we would be able to <laughs> stay home and you know protect the united states against any uh, intruders and people think i'm a dreamer <laughs> <laughs> That seems to me to be the way to go. You know, yes, let's well, learn, let's learn how to use our rifles. Let's learn how to, you know, let's, let's, let's be careful. You know, let's protect ourselves. But we don't need to go off and fight uh, foreign wars. Yes, well, unfortunately, <laughs> that isn't the way it'll work out if there's a draft. But I understand what you're saying, and, it, and what you're saying sounds a great deal like the Swiss system, where they have a very uh, what would you call it, an uh, oppressive draft. Uh, men have to go up until about 50. They have to spend a week or two every year in the military, and it's not much fun, but they think that's what's protected this country. I would say there are several other things that they're doing that have far greater effect on protecting their country and keeping it out of wars for the last two centuries. But, Bob, thank you very much for your call, and that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That's it for this week. I hope you will have a good week, and I hope you will just not lose hope. You don't have to be all excited. You don't have to talk to everybody you know, but just don't lose hope, and we'll keep working at this. Good night. Thanks so much for being with me tonight.